bobbin on, buzzer up, and we are angling. Welcome to the Pop-Up Rigs Masterclass. Myself and the other members of Team Calder are gonna talk you through pop-up rigs, where to use them, and how to tie them. But to be honest, it's taken me about 20 cars to get these three rods out in this horrendous crosswind. So I think I deserve a cup of tea. And once I've had that, I'm gonna show you my favorite pop-up rig. So my favourite pop-up rig over the last few years has been the hinge stiff rig. I used to use the chod rig a lot and I found that when it got overused, fish were working it out, you were dropping fish on it or not getting takes at all. I moved over to this and started catching them again. Chod rig's brilliant when it's first used, but because there's not a lot of movement in it, I think the fish do suss it out. This one is basically a chod rig, but just with a boom on the end of it, so there is more movement in that hook bait. One of the other things about this rig, similar to the Chod rig, is it hardly ever tangles. At the moment, I'm blasting it out there over 100 yards in a horrible crosswind, hitting the clip really hard, and it is not tangling. And you can't say that for many other rigs in that sort of situation. It incorporates a lot of stiff materials, which means it reacts really quickly in the fish's mouth, and it also hooks them really well. It's one of the great things about pop-up rigs in general. The hook ends up being in the middle of the bottom lip of the fish, you know, and when you catch them on pop-up rigs, they very, very rarely fall off. So if you're having problems with losing fish, moving over to something like this might cure that. So to talk to you about how I tie it, this particular one, I'm using a small hook. This is the same as the setup that I use in the spring. I'm using small hook baits, which haven't got that much buoyancy to them. So I'm using a small hook, so it all sits off the bottom really well. So to tie it, I first of all, I tie the upright section, and that is tied out of a material called mouth trap. Now it's a very, very stiff monofilament material. Once you've worked with it for a little while, it becomes just as easy to tie as any other hook link material. So first of all, I tie just a two turn half blood knot in that material onto a size 11 ring swivel. Pull that really tight, cut the tag end off really short, and then I tie the hook on. And that allows me to get the upright section as long or as short as I want. I mean, this one's pretty short. I like fishing them quite close to the bottom, especially in this situation where I'm putting a few boilies out as well. Um, if you were tying it the other way around and tying the hook on first, you would find it very, very difficult to get it as short as that. So once that swivel's tied on, I thread the line through the eye of the hook, and then I make a big loop underneath the hook. This is my whipping knot that I tie most of my hooks on with. With the front of that loop, I wrap it around the hook once, going up the hook, and then wrap it around again, going down the hook towards the eye. Carry on wrapping round, so I go around five times, and then the tiny little tag end at the top of the hook, basically that gets pulled tight, and that's what tightens the knot down. I then wet everything and pull it really, really tight and then slide it back down the shank of the hook so it sits against the eye like it is now. I then cut off that tag end, thread a medium sized rig ring onto it and then poke it back through the eye of the hook. And that's the other advantage of this particular knot. With the knotless knot, you'd have to go through the eye of that hook three times. With this one, you only have to go through it twice. So it's much, much easier to get that tag end bent round, rig ring on, poke it through the eye of the hook, cut it really short, and then burn it with a lighter, and that's what forms the D on the back of the hook. And the reason this one hooks them so well, I think, is because the bait and the hook are really close together, but there is still some movement there. The bait's not getting in the way of the hook when it turns and catches hold. So moving down from that, you'll see that the boom section is made out of a stiff coated material. This is hybrid stiff, my favorite coated material ever. I use it for bottom baits and pop-ups as well. The beauty of it in this situation is that you can crimp it. So I'm basically using the small size crimp, a 0.6 millimeter crimp. That material only just goes through it and that makes it really, really strong. It's actually stronger than tying a knot in it. It doesn't work in the softer material. So end trap soft, end trap semi stiff, those two don't work. They don't break, but it actually strips the coating off when you put it under tension. This hybrid stiff is so tough on the outside that that doesn't happen. And in this, if you're going to tighten a knot, it breaks at 20 pound. With a crimp, it breaks at over 30 pound. So it's very, very simple to do and very strong as well. So once you've poked it through one barrel, go through the ring swivel, back through the other barrel, pull it up really tight. That's really important. That creates loads of friction and makes it stronger. And then squeeze down with the crimping tool and make sure it's squeezed down evenly all the way along 
and you can test it with a rig tool as well if you want, pull it really, really tight. If it's gonna go, it'll go straight away if you've got it wrong. If you've got it right, you just won't be able to break it in your hands. And then moving down to the other end, I've done exactly the same thing, through the double barrel crimp once, round the ring swivel, back through again, crimp it down really tight with it pulled up really tight to the swivel, and that's it, pretty much the rig is done. At the end underneath the hook, I've got my counterbalance, which is dark matter putty, wrapped around the crimp. Yeah, so it's very, very sticky, that putty. I've just moulded it around, and I've got just enough on there so that the bait sinks pretty quickly. In this situation, it's very windy. I don't want the bait flying around if there is any water movement out there. And also, you know, I'll put bait out in the swim. The fish are going to be moving around reasonably quickly at this time of the year. I don't want it wafting up everywhere. In the spring, I might basically balance it so it's only just sinking. The fish are very lethargic then. There's no other bait in the swim to get them going and they'll get them moving around quick. And then you want the hook bait to fly up into their mouth really easily. But most of the time, as a default setting for me, I have that pop-up sinking quite quickly. Now, to make it look lovely and pretty like this, I've basically steamed it. I've used a solar rig comb, which is a brilliant bit of kit, put the hook into that rig comb, put it over the steam, and that achieves that lovely little curve in it. So it's basically acting like a bent hook without any of the problems of a bent hook. So it turns and catches hold really quickly. And then I've steamed the hook link straight, basically. So when it goes down onto the bottom, it sits out perfectly like that. And that also helps reduce tangles. If it gets kinked when you're fishing, just steam it again. Or if it's all straight in your rig box and you want to use it, put it in the rig cone, steam it again, and it will sit absolutely perfectly like that. And finally, just to talk to you about the lead system that I've got with it, this is basically the new HeliSafe system. So I'll be dumping the lead if I get a take. That is fished on the end of a lead core leader. So I've basically tied that myself. I've spliced it at either end. And basically to splice it, you pull out a few inches of the lead wire. Then you just tap the end of the lead core just to find out where the lead finishes. Go through with a very fine needle with a gate latch on it. Pull everything back through again. And I've done that on one end with that HeliSafe system and done it on the other end as well with just a loop and then I've pulled on that little fella in the middle there. That's basically a no trace bead. So it's like a tapered sleeve that you pull on. You have to wet it to pull it on to get it on properly. It does tend to bunch up, but then once you've wet it and pulled it down, you can open it out again and get it nice and straight like that, nice and tapered. And then in this case, I've got it about four or five inches up from the lead. And that's because I think the lead is plummeting into the silt out there. It's quite soft on the bottom. So having it that far up, it means that when I cast out, the hook link hits the bead, the lead can drop into the silt and present everything on top. And then that no trace bead, basically if I'm unlucky enough to lose the fish and the line breaks, that will pop off and the fish can get away from the lead. So that is the helicopter rig system that I'm using. I fish it like this in weed as well. Sometimes I'll have the bead right up the top of the lead core so the lead can plumb it down into the weed and leave the bait sitting above it. In this situation, you only need to separate the two by a few inches. And then finally, the main advantages of a lead core leader, because the lead's on the end of the line, it casts better than any other rig. That's why sea anglers use this kind of system. It also means that you feel the lead hit the bottom better because it's on the end of the line. Very versatile because you can change the weight of the lead really quickly. And with this HeliSafe system, you can decide to drop the lead or not. If it's very, very weedy out there, I'd want to be losing the lead and getting the fish up in the water. But all together, an absolutely brilliantly streamlined system. Very, very easy to tie. The whole thing comes ready tied if you don't want to tie it yourself. If you're going to fish pop-ups over the top of boilies or as a single hook bait, that's my number one choice. Play around with your rigs and watch how they perform in the edge, and that's a big part of my pop-up fishing. I'll never cast a rig out without checking it in the margin. And certain rigs, you want your pop-up to do a different job. So with a chod rig, I have them anchored quite hard to the deck, and with a hinge rig, I have it sinking really, really slowly. And basically, they're doing different things there. And unless you play around in the margins, adding putty, taking away putty, you're never going to understand how your rigs are performing, why they're working well for you and why they're not. And once you've got that understanding, you've got the way, you know, you've got, you've got something you like, you understand why your rig's doing what it's doing, it will definitely catch you more fish. If you're going to cast a pop-up rig into heavy weed, then I recommend you fold a bit of dissolving foam around the hook before you cast out. It will cut your casting down a little bit, but it's well worth doing because it holds the hook up above the weed as the rig comes to rest, and then it melts, disappears, and the rig flutters down onto the weed. But just be warned, if you use them in really cold water or you squeeze them on too tight, they can take over 10 minutes to come off.
This is the multi-rig I've converted over to this over the last couple of years. I love the fact that you can change the hook in seconds without wasting the rest of the hook link. And also the way it's tied, it's so simple to do. Basically, if you can tie an overhand loop knot, you can tie this rig. So in the end of the end trap semi-stiff, I've tied a figure of eight overhand loop knot, cut off the tag end, and then I've pushed that loop through the eye of the hook. So the breaking strain of the hook link and the sides of the hook have to match together. So in this case, it's 20 pound end trap semi-stiff and a size six crank choddy. And you can just about push two sections of that through the eye of the hook and then on goes a really big rig ring so that that bait slides up and down on the D that's been created. And then the end of that loop is basically lassoed onto the hook and pulled down into position like that. So the hook sits up almost straight off the lake bed. Now, the reason I've tied a figure of eight loop is one, it's very strong, but also it creates a big knot underneath the hook that you can mold the putty around. And you can see how neat that is together, sitting like that on the bottom. It's just one of the neatest pop-up rigs I've ever used. Underneath it, there's a little break in the coating. I've done that using the stripper tool, and that basically allows the hook to swivel and catch hold, and it also allows you to sit upright off the bottom by having that little tiny hinge underneath there. The hook link itself is about six or seven inches long. That's my sort of go-to length. I would use it longer if it was very, very weedy, and I would use it shorter as well if there wasn't much debris out there. And at the other end of that hook link, I've just tied another figure of eight loop knot and then I've just opened it up with a choddick tool over some steam just to create that nice big loop so we've got even more movement. It's important on this rig that you do steam it nice and straight and I've also steamed the other end just to create that almost straight angle coming out of that outturned eye and also to give the D a nice shape so the bait will slide up and down it. Now the bait itself is very very important in this situation you don't want them too buoyant so if you've got baits that are not very buoyant and you're struggling to fish them with a hinge stiff rig moving over to this will present them better. Because there's no metal underneath the hook, no ring swivel, you actually need more putty on this to sink the same pop-up. So a real buoyant one on this would end up with a massive lump of putty and it just looks horrible and I think it's more prone to tangling as well. So this one is a cork dust cell pop-up that I've made myself. I've just kneaded more and more cork dust into the paste and then rolled it into a ball and that's basically as much cork dust as you can get in without the bait actually crumbling apart as you roll it. And you can see there, I've got a reasonable amount of the dark matter putty. That will sink that pop up pretty quickly because I'm fishing this rig over a spread of boilies. That's one of the other beauties of this rig. By tying that loop really small, you can get the hook bait really close to the lake bed, much closer than you can with most hinge stiff rigs. When I'm fishing over a spread of boilies and I want to lift the hook up just a little bit, this does it perfectly without making it stand up too high. And then moving on to the lead system, I've got a helicopter rig on again, basically because it's very soft here on the lower mainard, and a helicopter rig allows the lead to plummet into the soft bottom and the hook link still be fishing proud above it. But the lead itself is a new design. It's called a helicopter lead, and basically it's a cross between a pair lead and a distance lead. So very, very stable in flight, but when the lead hits the bottom, there's a big area on the bottom of the lead to send that tremor down the rod so you know exactly what you're fishing on. And the other main difference, you can see there's no swivel on the top of it. You've got a rig ring in its place. And that's really, really neat. Clipped onto the heli safe as I've got it here. It makes a really neat setup. Keeps the bulk of the lead as close to the heli safe as possible, which I like as well. But it also means that the lead won't fall off too easily when you're using that system. Sometimes if you just chop the swivel off of a lead, clip it onto the heli safe. When you're winding it in, if the hook gets caught in a bit of weed, it can open the heli safe up and the leg can fall off when you don't want it to. So moving back onto the rig, if you want to fish the hook bait really close to the lake bed, or you're fishing over a spread of boilies and you want an absolutely brilliant hook hold, then I can't recommend the multi-rig enough. Give Squid Goo a go. A couple of years back, I was a bit sort of uh, unsure about the stuff, but I've used it for a long time now, and I can honestly say it's one of the biggest game changers I've ever had in my fishing. It's completely transformed my pop-up fishing, and these days, you know, if I'm using pop-ups, I'm using the squid goon. I have that much faith in it, particularly through the winter and the spring. Uh, but as bright hook baits go, you know, that if I could pick one, it would be, uh, it would be squid goon. You can basically use any kind of lead system with a pop-up rig, but if you're going to use a helicopter rig like me, 
then I recommend that you check that helicopter rig often. So if you're splicing lead core, make sure it's not frayed, make sure the splice hasn't started to come undone or the super glue has worked free because sometimes if you carry on using them all the time and you don't check them, they can fail on you just when you've got a big fish on the end. And I know because I've lost some big ones really close in where I've not checked the durability of the lead core leader. This is my armory of hook baits when I'm pop-up fishing. You can see loads of different colours, there's loads of different smells, and I chop and change stuff around to suit how much bait I'm putting in, what time of year it is, and what works on the lake I'm fishing. One thing will not work all the way through, I promise you, so it's important to chop and change until you get a winning formula and then stick with that. But very basically, when the fish have just woken up in the spring, I'll just use single hook baits, put hardly any bait in the swim at all, and I use higher tracks. And I'll probably have three different ones on three rods. As soon as I get bites on one of them, I swap all rods over to that. So to talk to you about my different higher tracks, probably my all time favorite at the moment is the Squid Supreme. I only use the Goose as higher track hook baits. I used to make my own ones, but I caught so many more on the good ones that that's what I've swapped over to. I use the mainline pop-ups as the base for that. They're really buoyant, just the right size, and the goo soaks into them brilliantly. So the Squid Supreme is probably my all-time number one now. Caught some massive fish on that. Obviously, we did brilliant in Belgium on that when we went over there last summer. And then probably my other favourite is also a pink one. I love that colour. It's the almond. Needs no introduction, really. It works so well on the underwater films. You know, and changing over to that was literally like flicking a switch. It was almost like we had a lure on the end. The fish were just smashing into it, and it got loads and loads of bites. And that almond supreme, they were white baits to start off with, just like the squids. But over the course of the last year, they've soaked it in, and it's literally the pink has eaten all the way through to the middle. So you've got flavour and colour all the way through them. And then moving on to the white ones. White's a brilliant colour. I've caught on it everywhere I've gone. These ones are the white cell pop-ups and I've put a new goo on them. It's called winter berry. It's a really sort of pungent berry smell. It's the first white goo in the range. It doesn't turn a pink bait white, but it will just soak into these white ones and not change the colour at all. And I reckon that is going to be an absolute winner over the coming months. And then next to that, the bumbleberry. Smells different from the winter berry. It's more of like a sherbetty, sort of almost an IB sort of smell. That is going to be an absolute winner as well. They started as white hook baits, and you can see it's turned them a really bright red, which a couple of my mates on the Syndicate Lakes I fish have said is one of their favorite colors. And then the one at the back, I had to use this one on this session. It's Tom's favorite on the Walthamstow complex. It's the pineapple supreme. Everyone I know that's used it has caught absolutely loads on it. It's a lovely yellow colour. So these started off as pink baits. It's turned them that lovely sort of egg yolk yellow. Love that colour, far more than the really bright yellows. And anything that you're putting on there supreme wise, you can keep putting on. So any of the really thin goos, just keep putting them on, keep putting them on. They will soak in over a matter of months and that flavour will go right through to the core. So that's the higher track hook baits. Moving over to the match the hatch, what I've found is if I'm feeding loads of boilies at the height of summer, sometimes I've had higher tracks on and the fish are showing all over me and I can't get a bite, I've put a matching one on and caught one straight away. So I always let the fish tell me what to use, but if you're fishing and you think, oh, I should have caught one by now, it's worth having a change. And when I moved over to these when we were in Belgium last year, I had three really nice fish in quick succession. We were feeding loads of banoffees. They're like a dark brown colour as well. Put these over the top and caught straight away. So you really do need to gauge what's happening on your fishery at the time and match your hook baits to that. And then finally, I'm not a fan of big pop-ups. You'll see here, these are all sort of 12 to 16 mil. Anything above that, I think it's too in your face, too garish, and I think fish can avoid it. So if you keep them to this sort of size, mix and match depending on the fishing you're doing and the time of year, that's what will keep your results consistent. When I'm pop-up fishing, I always have an element of cork in my hook baits, whether it's a cork ball pop-up or simply like an air ball style pop-up drilled out and then plugged with cork. And the reason I do that, cork doesn't change buoyancy. You know, a pop-up of any makeup 
will take on water and as it, as it takes on water, the buoyancy changes and obviously they become heavier. So a rig can start to lean and that sort of stuff. So the more cork you've got in a bait, the more stable the buoyancy of your pop-up's gonna be. And basically, if you, if you have your rig set to exactly how you want it to perform when it goes into the lake, when you're checking it in the margin before you cast out, the idea of having a lot of cork in there is in that, say, 10, 12 hours time, once the water's absorbed inside the bait, it's still gonna be performing in sort of pretty much the same way as it went out. Whereas if you put a bait out there with no cork in it, the longer it's out there, the more water it's gonna take on and the more the sort of the way the rig's performing is gonna change with the, within the period of time that it's set out there in the lake. Yeah. Well, after a really weird take, we are into a carp. And uh, it's gone right down the margins here. And this one is on the hinge stiff rig. And because I've been putting a lot of cell out there, I put a match the hatch on this one, the cork dust cell pop up. And uh, that's the one that's roared off. There we go, it's time, come on, come on. Come on, you lovely old Walthamstow warrior, get in that net. Yes, get in! That is an absolute result. How about that? That is an absolute result on a day session at Walthamstow Lower Maynard, a 24 pound original. I absolutely love these fish and it was nailed on a size 8 choddy, hinge stiff rig and a cell cork dust pop up. Wicked. Right, last time around we were at Walthamstow. I was with Dan. This time around we're at Ladywell. As you can see, we're with Mr. Peck. So we're going to be doing the same sort of thing, talking through all our favourite pop-up rigs, how we use them, why we use them, and when we use them. 
and uh, true to form, Dale is playing one on his favourite pop-up rig right now. He's having a go, isn't he? Yeah. Back to that tuning, <laughs> <laughs> deep diving. Yeah. Oh, here we go. He's a lovely William. Oh, oh, get him, get him. Yeah. Good work, Good work, mate. Well, here it is, a cracking Ladywell 26 linear. Um, we arrived yesterday, had a quick trot round, didn't really see any fish. So we set up at the deeper end of the, uh, the lake that we've been told. And uh, as we were getting set up, a few fish started showing and the odd sort of bubble started coming up. And it was really clear that there was a few fish about. And uh, it's really obvious in that situation that you don't want to scare them, you know. You're trying to get out as minimally as possible and uh, single pop-ups, they come into their own in that sort of situation. So I've gone out there, one or two casts, searching out the better drops, not just anywhere, exactly where the fish are showing, exactly where the bubbles are coming up, and uh, this is the result. Well, here it is, one of my favorite little pop-up presentations. And uh, for all intents and purposes, it's very much like a hinge stiff rig. You've got stiff boom, critically balanced pop-up, and it just sits up there on a the little hinge. Last year in Belgium, we turned up on a lake we'd never fished before, sim fish topping, cast out, got a drop, and you need to get a drop with this sort of rig. It needs to land on a fairly firm bottom. And uh, within a half an hour, an hour of getting there, we had a 50 pounder on it. So it's a big fish rig, it's a small fish rig, and it's really, really easy to tie. First thing you need to do is strip four inches of coating off of uh, the semi-stiff material, and that's what you're gonna tie your hair loop from. Fold it over roughly an inch from where the coating starts, tie my overhand knot, and uh, like I say, you want it to be an inch long, including the loop to where the uh, coating starts. From there, you put the boilie onto the loop, and then place your boilie stop inside, and I like to use the baiting needle just to crush that boilie stop down into the bait. It makes it look a little bit neat and tidier, and it certainly can't hurt. From there, thread it through the back of a size 8 choddy hook. Really important that you use a size 8 choddy because it's got that back turned eye and that allows that coating to uh, just come out at the correct angle. So once you've threaded that through, draw the boilie up to the bottom of the bend so it's just brushing. Tie a nine turn, nine turn knotless knot and that's so the hair exits exactly opposite with the point. And then uh, basically now your hook is connected to your bait. From that point, I thread it through the uh, stripper tool I go through the back side of the circle towards the blade and I bring the hook down towards the circle at the back of the stripper tool until there's roughly about 10 centimetres of material from the hook side to the, to the inner side of the stripper tool and I drop it down onto the cutter on the reverse side, breaking the coating. I'm not really stripping it, I'm just trying to break the coating. Once I've broke the coating, I use a small split shot, whichever one counterbalances the pop-up that I'm using and I just push it down that little break up against the coating on the swivel end and just pull the hook in through until I've got roughly five mil of braid exposed. And that just gives the rig its hinge. And then from there, I'm tying directly to a hybrid uh, leg clip. And I try and keep my boom about six inches and I use a four turn grinner knot. So once you've tied your grinner knot, the rig is complete. There's one last thing to do though, and that is to steam it straight. And then just on the hook section, just at this part here, just create 
a little bit of curvature in that like that, and that just helps when the fish tensions the rig to roll the hook over into the bottom lip. When you're baiting with pop-ups, it's really important to sort of uh, judge how low you're going to have your pop-up in comparison to how wide you're spreading your bait. So basically, if I'm going to be using a catapult, for example, I've put a pop-up rig next to a marker float, I might be catapulting bait over the top of that. If I'm going to put my bait tight, my pop-up will be fished low. Now, if I'm going to use a throwing stick, and fish over a big area, you know, a couple of tennis court size, then I'll happily fish sort of three, four inch pop-ups, normally a chod rig in that situation. But the baiting, the way you, the bait you're using for one, you know, particles and stuff, you want to be fishing really low to the deck. If you are going to use a pop-up, I wouldn't personally advise it. And when you're boilie fishing, you know, like I say, the tighter your boilies are, the smaller you want your pop-up, and the wider spread your boilies are, the taller you want it to be. Well, if you needed any more proof about the effectiveness of my pop-up rig, here's all the proof you'll ever need. 31 pounds of Lady Well Common. The fish have been topping out in front of me. I've just gone in there, no marker rod, flipped out that little pop-up rig, felt the lead down. It's clear enough to fish by getting a drop. A few boilies, kept it really light, really minimal, no disturbance, and the fish are hanging around. One of the greatest things about single pop-ups is you don't need to create a feeding scenario and what I mean by that is you don't necessarily need to put loads of bait over them to get a bite. A lot of my fishing to start with, when I, especially when I arrive at new venues that I don't know, you know, I don't know the hot spots, so I go around, I look for fish and if I see any bubbling, any chopping, I just flick out and as long as I get a good drop, you know, a definitive kickback on the rod tip, I know that that bait is fishing presented and if the carp has the opportunity to see it, it has the opportunity to take it, and uh, often that is all you need to get a bite. three or four fish show on the far bank and sort of much the same as what Daryl's used his pop-ups to do, casting it showing fish. Slung them out there probably getting on for two hours ago now. Went around a little while ago, put a bit of bait out over there while Daryl watched my rods for me. And the middle rod is just absolutely busted off. I haven't seen the fish yet, but he's right in close now. Good job. Cheers, mate. Right, well, here he is. Lovely 20 pound, eight ounce common. 
And this one really highlights sort of when pop-ups really come into their own. Now you can use a bottom bait to cast around the lake, there's no doubt in that, but, and you can use a pop-up at the same time to cast to a marker float, you know, it's entirely up to you. But what you can't really do with a bottom bait is cast to areas of sort of unknown territory and rely on a presentation, whereas with a pop-up rig, you can do that time and time again. As long as you get a half decent drop, you're gonna be fished, you know, the bait's suspended off the deck, and this is exactly what I've done here. I've seen fish showing, cast to it, like I say, it hasn't taken very long to go. That's my rig balanced out and ready to go. Now this is my favourite pop-up rig and in actual fact it's probably my favourite rig sort of that I use really. You know, it's not quite as versatile as a trod rig in the sense that you can uh, cast it wherever you want and it's going to present, but it is very versatile in the sense that you can fish it in pretty much every situation other than into thick weed and I have done that. You know, I fished it over gravel, silt, light leaves, light weed. It's a rig I came up with probably or getting on now, I reckon seven, eight years ago probably now. Basically at the time I was using the more traditional style hinge stiff rig, which is uh, stiff components all the way through. So this rig, you've got a stiff hook section, which is really good for hooking the fish. Obviously it's hard for them to eject, keeps its shape really well. So I put a nice curve in it and that means it turns and spins in the fish's mouth and grabs hold of the bottom lip. The main difference is the boom section. So on this, it's 15 pound semi stiff, but I'll tie that with 15 pound end trap soft as well. The idea being that Rather than a traditional stiff boom, the soft boom allows this rig to present really well over absolutely anything, like I say, over leaves and stuff as well. Now, when I used to use the traditional stiff rig with the stiff boom section, if you put it over leaves and stuff like that, sometimes, because I balance the rig so it sinks very slowly, there's not enough weight there. So if you sit over uneven ground, the rig will, will sink, but the, the putty won't actually settle on the ground. Whereas with the soft hook link, as you can see in my hands as I'm holding it, there's a nice curve in it, and basically that will land and just it'll kick away from the lead. There's a little bit of putty in the middle there. That'll just kick away from the lead and present over absolutely anything, which I think is really important and uh, something I certainly want it to do. Now, the other reason I use it with a soft boom section is when it goes into the mouth, you know. With a soft boom section, it doesn't really matter what angle the fish takes the rig from, it's going to fly back into the mouth. If you've got a stiff hook section, the angle the fish is picking up the bait from can affect how, one, how free the hook section is once it's in the mouth, to how easily it goes into the mouth and also it cuts out the amount of angles a fish can pick it up from. The main reason I started using the hinge stiff rig was because it's big fish selective. Now I can absolutely guarantee you that is true um, and particularly if the pop-up's a little bit taller. That is relatively short that one but the lake I'm fishing here today it's not full of big fish so better suited in a shorter length. But if you know if you've got big carp in your lake and a lot of small ones surrounding them which are the sort of lakes I fish normally do have, you're talking one or two big fish and a lot of small ones. That's why I use the hinge stiff rig, you know, because I can have small fish feeding on a spot and the big ones will generally take this with a bit more gusto than the others, you know. And any of you who've watched the uh, Underwater 8 DVD, you will see there lots of small fish in the swim, ignoring it. You know, they want to take it, but they can tell something's just a bit different. They sense this up off the bottom, um, but that big old common, he come in, snapped it straight up. I've seen that plenty of times at plenty of different lakes, you know, it's particularly if you can watch fish in the edge. I've had small fish feeding amongst big fish on things like boardy crumb, and I've put this rig in amongst it, and for a while you're watching, it looks like nothing's going to pick the hook bait up, but all those small ones are avoiding it, and then bang out the blue, one of the biggest ones there sucks it straight into his mouth and the fish is hooked. So that's a really good reason. You know, if you want to be selective in your fishing, not just this pop-up rig, but any pop-up rig will help pick out the bigger fish. The first thing I do is take a length of 25 pound mouth trap, I normally use about a foot, trim that off, I then place the hook alongside the middle of that length of mouth trap and form a whipping knot. Now, you can use a knotless knot if you want, it's entirely up to you, but I use the whipping knot simply because it's a knot I've used for years and I just haven't changed, but either will do. Once you've done that, you'll have two tag ends. Now, the top tag end coming out the top of the hook, you want to trim that down quite short because that's going to form your D at a later date. And the bottom end, you want to leave nice and long. Four to six inches is ideal, makes joining the stiff material to the supple material a lot easier. So, take a length of either 15 pound end traps off or 15 pound semi stiff. Again, probably 14, 15 inches of that you want to be using. Snip a bit of that off and then hold the two hook links side by side. With the hook links side by side, you then want to tie a three turn grinner knot over the mouth trap section. Pull it down tight so it's gripping the mouth trap. And then basically you can do the same thing again, but this time around you're going to be tying the grinner knot into the mouth trap, but you're going to be doing two turns, not three. Now when I tie that knot, I pull the loop down very small which means that as I tighten the knot, the hook section doesn't stray too far from what I want it. So if I want the hook section to be two inches long, 
it will be two inches and a little bit. If you tie it with the grid and knot of a big loop, you're going to end up with a much longer hook section than you want. So that's the key to getting the hook section to stay the length you want it at. And that's particularly useful when you're trying to keep them quite short like this. So once you've done the back-to-back -back grid and knot, trim the tags off. I leave a little tag end on the, uh, on the end of the semi-stiff and I, the tag end from the mouth trap, I blob it with a lighter just to get it out of the way. Once you've blobbed that off, I then remove about an inch of the coating from beneath the knot. So the reason I do that is to allow some movement into the hook section. If you don't remove the coating there, then the hook will fly into the mouth fine, but you're dramatically going to uh, decrease the amount of movement the rig has in the mouth. And that's really important as to getting the perfect hook hold in the bottom lip. You can form the D whenever you like, but when doing so, I like to make sure the D is not too big, not too small, just enough to allow a lot of movement. And in order to form the D, it's very simple. You, with the tag end coming off the top of the hook, you simply slide a medium rig ring onto there, pass the tag end through the back of the hook and out the front, trim it off, and then blob it with a lighter. And there, your D will be perfectly formed. And then moving up to the top of the rig, I tie another grinner knot, nine inches. So I place the knot on my rig board, the knot where the two hook links join on the rig board at nine inches, pinch it at the top, tie another grinner knot so that when it's done, I get nine inches between the putty here at the bottom of the hook section and the top of the rig. So I've just formed the loop by grinner knot, tightened down early. And once I've done that, I slide a bit of shrink tube over the knot, which I steam down at a later date. Now the reason that shrink tube's there, bit of a funny one really, I mean one day I had a tag and I was looking at my tag again and I just thought, you know what, I don't like that, I'm going to streamline that. So I put a bit of shrink tube over it and it seems to stiffen up the loop, so it's kind of acting as a bit of a kicker for you at the same time, as well as streamlining the rig and just getting that horrible little tag end hidden and out of the way. In the middle of the hook section, I position a really small bit of putty. What that helps to do is as the rig kicks away, that falls quicker and just helps the sort of far end of the rig kick out nice and straight every time. Um, and then to complete the rig, you put a bit of putty around the knot, covers it up nice and neat, attach your pop up to the end, which the putty will obviously weigh down. And uh, that's where it's really important to balance it right so the rig sinks nice and slow. Normally I want this rig from this position as it hits the water, to a vertical position, or that to take at least five seconds to sink. So when you're doing that, watch out for that. But once you've done that, you know, once you've balanced it out like I just did, it's perfect, ready to go. And like I say, that'll catch you a cart from pretty much anywhere you'll ever cast it. Over the years, I've used various different pop-ups. You know, I've tried all sorts of combinations, flavours and colours, but uh, one that has done really, really well for me in recent years is the mainline milky toffees in 10 or 12 mil, though, about 12 mil, and uh, add the thin squid goo, the uh, supreme version. That cuts right into them. They seem to hold the flavour, and although it's leaking out throughout the length of time it's in the water, when you bring them back, it almost stops the bait taking on uh, the bad, bad smells of silt and stuff like that. So if you're worried about using a bait that might be getting contaminated by dirty smells on the bottom, look no further than a milky toffee with some squid goo. I think when deciding what to use, whether you're going to say you use a chod rig or a hinge diff rig, for example. Now, to me, I think the hinge diff rig is a much better hooker of fish. The hook holds are generally deeper. If I know what the spot's like, I will always choose a hinge diff rig over a chod rig. You know, but if my main aim is to be running around the lake, just casting at shows, and I'm, I know I'm going to be fishing to areas where sort of unseen ground, I don't want to have five, six casts to sort of suss the area out, I'll use a chod rig then. Right, well when we came to Ladywell, me and Dale were both hoping to catch one of these, a proper Ladywell baby, and uh, we've had some other really nice fish as well, so I've had good fun and I'm sure you have as well, mate. Yeah, turned up, luckily the fish were here, bubbling and showing, got out without the mark, float, just cast those little pop-up rigs out there, felt the lead down, I know that they're fishing, much the same as I do in my big carp fishing, turn up, try and find them, get a drop, and just go in as minimally as possible. Yeah, I and mean, that's been the idea of this section. Between me, Dan and Daryl, we've wanted to give you a proper insight into our pop-up fishing, why we do things, how we do things, and hopefully, through all the information you've seen and watched, you'll be able to go out there too, pick some bits, fly them to your own fishing, and catch yourself plenty of carp as well. Mm -hmm.